Take your Bibles, if you would, please. Uh, let's go to the book of Judges this morning. Up there on the screen, who in here knows what that word is? Luz. Very good. Do you know what it is? Huh? No! I mean, uh, no. Didn't mean to sound so forceful there. Huh? It's a city! Are you sure? It is. That's not a trick question. It is. It's a city. Okay? Uh, when you're reading the Bible... God has little surprises in there, okay? Little things that when they catch your attention, the Holy Ghost just goes like this and says, take a look at that, okay? Take a look at that. And you say, well, what does that mean? And the Holy Ghost loves that question because He loves to answer questions from the Bible. And like I say, I, I was working on a different message for this morning, and it was going to be all nice and gooey and fun and happy and all the kinds of things, and God wouldn't let me preach it. He wanted me to preach this. And so, um, take your Bible. I told you to turn to the book of Judges, and I want you to hold your place. Judges chapter 1, okay? In fact, let me put that up on the screen. Judges chapter 1, and uh, let me give you the background on the book of Judges. The chronological progression is from Genesis to Deuteronomy is the days of Moses. Starting with the book of Exodus, Moses leading the people out of Egypt and their 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Moses, because of his sin and his willful disobedience of God, God would not allow Moses to go into the promised land. Moses was allowed to see it. But God would not allow him to go into it. And um, now that doesn't mean that Moses died and went to hell. We know different. Because in Matthew 17, the transfiguration of Jesus, it was Moses and Elijah that appeared from heaven with Jesus as they were. And what that represents, Moses was the law and Elijah was the prophet. And what you have is on the day of transfiguration, and I said that word and the light came out. Do you see that? Transfiguration. It's not, don't work again, I don't guess. But anyway, um, on the day of transfiguration, when God said, this is my beloved son, and the Bible says that Jesus' face shone brighter than the sun, it was Moses and Elijah who was there with him. And the, and the picture of that is, the teaching of that is, that Moses and the law and the prophets do give testimony to, to Jesus Christ. Jesus does not come and draw us to the law. The law draws us to Christ. Amen? And some of the, you pray, you pray for anybody who has bought into this lie from these Hebrew Roots people, and they are, listen, they're scattered everywhere. And they're pulling people away right and left because they're telling everybody that God sent Jesus to testify of Moses. Who's Moses? Moses wasn't even allowed to go into the Promised Land. God sent Moses to testify of His Son, Jesus Christ. Okay? So anyway, that's, that's what happens there. But anyway, you have Moses, not allowed to go in the Promised Land, then you have Joshua, who represents Christ, his second coming, who can take them into the promised land. So here we have Joshua taking Israel in the promised land. The book of Joshua is about the battles that Joshua fought and the partitioning of the land. Now that those battles have been fought, the wars have been settled, now we're into the book of Judges. We're going to find that what God told the Israelites to do before they went into the promised land was not what they did when they got there. We're going to find that out. 
And we're going to make a spiritual application to everybody listening to my voice, including my own two ears. Okay? We'll make an application to that. So in the book of Judges now, they're, they're in the land, but God's going to deal with them straight away. And He's going to, he's going to correct them, He's going to reprove them. You think, boy, we won the battle, it's D-Day, let's have us a big party. And it's not how, that's not how it worked out. Judges chapter 1, verse 22. The house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel. Can you think of what I'm thinking of when I say the word Bethel? House of God, here, right here. This is for us, okay? Uh, Joseph went up against Bethel and the Lord was with them. The house of Joseph sent out to descry Bethel. Does anybody know what the word descry means? Huh? Anybody know? I'll give you a free video. Descry is similar to the word describe. Moses, uh, uh, Joseph sent people out to spy on Bethel. Okay? Now, I don't think there's spies in Bethel. Okay? Sent it to spy out the city. Why? Because they hadn't taken that city yet. And so they sent out a recon team to take a look at the city, find out if it's walled city, how to get inside the city, uh, how many troops they might have up on the walls, how many troops they got waiting behind the gates, and this, just in other words, we need information before we go to battle against them. We need, uh, we need recon, we need it, uh, information to know before we get into it with them what it is that we're dealing with. So verse 24, and the spies saw him. See, the Bible tells you that he went out to describe Bethel. Now, the name of the city before was Luz, and the spies saw a man. See, the Bible is defining the word describe for you. It means to spy it out, to look it out. But I want you to notice that the name of Bethel, before it was Bethel, was Luz. Huh? Luz. That was the name of Bethel before it was Bethel. Who named it Bethel, by the way? Does anybody know? Jacob did. He said, this is not other than the house of God, and these are the gates of heaven. So he set up a stone, he anointed it. That stone is Christ. And he said, this is Bethel. This is the, this is the house of God. The verse 24, And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee mercy. Sounds good. But it's not. It sounds right, but it's not right. And I'll show you why in a minute. Verse 25, And when he showed them the entrance into the city, they smote the city with the edge of the sword, but they let go the man and all his family. What well, sounds merciful, doesn't it? The man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called the name what? Luz, which is the name thereof unto this day. I could have called the message, Luz lives. Luz lives. Okay, so Lindsay, Antonio, let Lindsay know when she asks what the name of the message. He always asks me on Monday, what's, Dad, what's the name of the message you preach? Just remember, Luz lives. Okay, that ought to be enough to spark people's curiosity. Turn to uh, Genesis chapter 28. Genesis 28. Here's, here's how Jacob named it. Jacob awaked out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar, and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and he will 
and keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. You pray for me this morning. Okay? I need your help. I need God's help preaching. So you pray for me this morning, all right? Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear God, for the opportunity to stand before this congregation of people. Lord, if I were to measure myself against you, Lord, I would admit that I have no right to stand here. Lord, I don't have a right for these people to listen to me. And so, Father, I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just settle it in my mind that I'm here by the grace and the mercy of Jesus Christ and by His blood and by Your favor, Lord, is why we're all here, not because we deserve to be, but, Father, we're here, Lord, because we need to be. And, Lord, this message that gets preached today, I need to hear it. My family needs to hear it. My church family needs to hear it. These people that are watching with us online and visiting with us, very faithful people, Lord, they need to hear it. People, Lord, all over this world need to hear this. We need to know, dear God, that we didn't do everything right. So, Father, help us, uh, teach us the lesson. Lord, help me, dear God, to convey it the way that you sent it into my heart. I thank you, God, for opening my eyes. Lord, had it not been for the Holy Spirit, I would have never been able to preach this, and I know it. Father, thank you for giving me what to look at. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving me the word to search out. And I pray, dear God, again, Lord, that I would be able to convey this to the hearts and lives of people here. Because, Father, we need to be reminded that we let some things go. And we didn't do it all right. Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. In the book of Numbers, Israel vowed a vow before God. I want you to look at this. This is... Very, very germane to what I'm going to be preaching to you this morning. And, it, and believe it or not, it shouldn't take long to convey this. I've only got five more verses of Scripture for the message. i only got five more. That shouldn't take too long. In Numbers 21, verse 1, the Bible says, When King Arad, the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies... Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, If thou wilt indeed deliver this people unto my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. Now, you can mark that place in your Bible and you can check me out after church today. In Numbers 21, the, the king there of uh, King Arad, the Canaanite, when, when he stole some of the Jews and took them as prisoners... It made Israel mad, and they said, that's our people, we're going to go get them back. Uh, I wish that we would have had a, a, a strong president when Iran stole our embassy people back in the late 70s. How many of y'all remember that? The Iran hostage crisis went on way longer than it ever should have been. They declared war. Listen. That embassy was the United States of America. And they invaded our territory and took our people prisoner. And we should have had a man and a Congress to stand up against them and said, we may lose the people, but you're not going to get away with this. And we never should have sent them how many billions of dollars back a few years ago. Never should have done that. And people don't like our president now because he's taken a stand against those rats. Amen. So they took some of the Jews hostage in Israel that got them fired up and they said, we're not going to put up with this. So they went to the Lord and they said, Lord, 
If you'll help us, we will utterly destroy their cities. Now, I want you to, here's the word that God gave me last night. Utterly. What does that mean? What does utterly mean? Totally. All the way, I'm going to destroy all of their cities. God, if you'll help me, I will destroy every last piece of it. Won't be anything left. God, if you'll help me. Now, if you keep reading Numbers 21, God helped them. And you know what they did? They utterly destroyed their cities. They did what they told God they were going to do. They did it. And God blessed them. Does everybody get my point so far? Now, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 7. I couldn't believe when I saw this. Bless you guys. We love you. Bye, Stacy. See you, buddy. Bye, Gary. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I said, man, this Bible is so right. The time span between Deuteronomy 7 and the book of Judges is getting up close to 200 years difference. That's like writing something, somebody writing a prophecy in 1776 and it be fulfilled 220 years later exactly the way it was supposed to be. Okay? That's, that's the difference between Deuteronomy and the book of Judges. Anywhere from, I'd say probably 110 years to 150, maybe even 200 years difference between Deuteronomy 7 and the book of Judges. Deuteronomy 7 verse 2, When the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, Thou shalt smite them, and what's that word again? Utterly destroy them. So what does that mean? Totally. I want you to destroy every city. I want you to kill their kings and all their families. Utterly destroy them. We do not want anything left. Especially when you find their religious practices, when you find their groves, I want you to tear their groves up. When you find their altars, I want you to destroy their altars. Do not leave them. Do not capture them and put them in a museum. God says, what they're doing in there, I don't want any remembrance of it. God said, it's wicked and I want no remembrance of it whatsoever. I don't want you to send guys from the university out to say, Oh, what a great find this is. We need to preserve this. God said, no, I want you to utterly destroy it. Gr grind it into powder if you have to. What did Moses do with the golden calf that they made? What did he do, Caleb? Broke it, ground it into powder. And then made them drink it. How much of it is left? And who wants to go picking through sewage to capture the God back? He said, Utterly destroy them, and thou shalt make no, watch this, thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. God said, Don't do it. Now, what I have underlined up there, he said, Utterly destroy them, make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. See what I have underlined up there? Now, I want you to go back to Judges, in the city of Luz. Let's read this again. In verse 24, And the spies saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said unto him, Show us, we pray thee, the entrance into the city, and we will show thee what? Mercy. What's wrong with showing this man mercy? God said, don't do it. They go to this city. They have a commandment by God to utterly destroy this city and every Man, woman, child, every family that's part of this city. The spies are, are camped out outside the city. They see a man coming down the road from Luz, from the city. And they say to him, where's the entrance to this city? Show it to us and we'll show you mercy. They made a deal. Now, who did, they, who did they make a deal with? Do we know who this man was? I wasn't able to, to detect who it was. 
that came out of this city. But you know, it could have very well been the king of this city. And the spies wouldn't have known it. The king might have had his spies outside the city come inside and say, King, there's some spies out there from, from the Jews. And uh, they're out there spying on this land. We know what that means. That means that they're preparing for war, king. And the king might have thought, you know what? I'm hamburger. They're going to they're gonna destroy it. God's with them. They're going to destroy everything. I think I need to slip out of here. And he may have put on the, the, the clothes of a beggar and walked out of that city, walking down the road like he was nobody. And the men here could have made a deal with the very king who they were supposed to destroy. They didn't know who it was. The bottom line is, they were not supposed to show this man mercy. They made a covenant with this man to show him mercy, and God said, don't do it. So, after they destroyed Luz, Luz is destroyed. Luz is no more, right? Wrong. Because the Bible says that the man and his family left Luz, went into the land of the Hittites, and what did he do? He rebuilt the very city that the Jews destroyed. Had they not let him live, Luz would not be around today. Are you listening to me? I'm waiting on the, I'm stalling. I'm waiting on the Lord here to just give me some really good words to drive this home with you. But here's the gist of it. When you got saved, you wanted things in your life different. You wanted holy things instead of unholy things. You wanted clean things instead of dirty things. You wanted a different lifestyle, a different way. You wanted to pray, read your Bible, tell others, come to church. You wanted everything different. If you remember, when you got saved, you actually had the zeal to do it. Right? Because what happens is when we get saved, the Holy Ghost comes in us and gives us a zeal. And we repent of everything. God cleanses us of everything. And we have this zeal in us that, I'm, listen, I'm so mad at the devil, I never want to serve him a day in my life. Devil, you, you're, you've had it as far as I'm concerned. I'm not giving you another day of my life. And that's how we think when we first get right with God. And in that zeal, there are things that we should have killed and destroyed and put out. And as we had it in our hand to get rid of it, we decided not to. I knew a man that was... Uh, he was trying to recover from doing drugs. And in his recovery process, about four or five weeks into it, he uh, went backwards, fell off the wagon. And he told me, he said, what happened was, he said, I was, I was having a bad time anyway. Things at home weren't going well. And he said, I accidentally found an old stash of drugs that I had hidden. And I let him talk for a while. And I said, look, I don't want you mad at me. But I'm going to say something to you. You tell me if I'm right or wrong. You didn't accidentally find anything. You knew exactly where it was. And he looked down. And he said, yeah. And I said, if I were you, I'd get somebody who's really strong in your life 
and go through everything that you own so that you don't accidentally find the other three stashes that you've got. He said, how did you know I had three more? I said, I don't know. I just picked the number. <laughs> he should have destroyed it when he first wanted to get right. But he held on to it for such a day as that day, and then he went right back to it. And then tried to make like, I, didn't, I just, I just opened, opened something up and there it fell out. It's like pouring all this gold into a pot, all of a sudden this calf jumped out of it. I have no idea where that came from. And then all of a sudden now, this man goes back and the city that you thought was destroyed, he turned around and rebuilt it. Now you've got it to deal with all over again. This Bible's wise, isn't it? Listen, God has already foreseen all of your choices of your life and He's got you figured out. I have no idea who I'm preaching this to. I don't know if it's anybody here, somebody online. I don't know and I don't care. I mean, I care about you, but I don't care who I'm preaching to. God told me, God told me, God get put all this in my heart. God said, Mike, do it this way, say it this way. This is what I'm trying to convey to you. Is that we were told to utterly destroy. And in our zeal, we were going to. And we didn't. And the truth of it is, people that have, let's say, addictions to alcohol or drugs, whether it's heroin, pot, or even an addiction to prescription pills or whatever it is, or let's say that they're hooked on porn or they're hooked on sex chatting online or any number of very, very wicked things that are part of this world right now. More than likely, I won't say everybody does, but a lot of people fall backwards. Why? Because Luz was supposed to be totally destroyed. And all you had to do was let one guy out and his family. And then he rebuilt it on you. And now you've got it to deal with all over again. Uh, where am I at? Turn to Leviticus 13. Leviticus 13. Let me show you how this works. Let me show you how God sees it. Leviticus chapter 13, verse 42. God is giving Israel the law concerning um, leprosy. Leprosy is a type of sin. It is uncleanness. Now, if you look at your Bible. He said in verse 42, If there be in the bald head or bald forehead a white reddish sore. And, and what God's doing, if you read this whole section, God is outlining the pre precautions and the uh, prescriptions and everything that pertains to to leprosy, because God understands leprosy, a very, very contagious disease. So is sin. It is a very contagious disease. And if one person has sin disease, more often than not, he's going to infect everybody around him. So God said, now, if you know, he gave the law concerning people's houses and people's skin and what it's what it's supposed to look like on their arm. Then he starts dealing with men. He's, he's talking, talking about. He said, if a man, you know, is, if he's bald on his whole head, he's fine. That's no big deal. If he's forehead bald, I like that phrase, forehead bald. If he's forehead bald, you know that you know we just had that what they call receding hairline. 
And he said if his forehead bald and the skin, you know, looks good, then he's fine. It's just because he's bald, that doesn't mean he's sick, he's got a disease or anything like that. But he said if you look on the man's bald head, he said if he has a white reddish sore, a white reddish sore, a means one. One sore, one little sore on his bald head. It is leprosy sprung up in his bald head or his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look upon it. Behold, if the rising of the sore be white, reddish in his bald head or in his bald forehead, as the leprosy appeareth in the skin of the flesh, he is at... By the way, what color is sin? It's red. That's why God made it red. He said, it's red. And he said, that man has leprosy. He is unclean. Now you look at the last part of verse 44. The priest shall pronounce him utterly unclean. What does utterly mean? Totally. Completely. Because you know what we do, don't you? What we do? With one sin, what we do, we say, well, that's just, that's just one sin. I mean, here, let's, let's say there's a man out there. I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a booger head. I don't know where I came up with that one, but. He's had four or five hundred different women. Some at the same time. He's a drunkard. He's, he's making methamphetamine. He's shooting up heroin, doing cocaine. He is doing everything. I mean, his life is so full of sin. He stinks all the time. I mean, I mean, he just, he's lazy, won't work. He's, I mean, he's awful. And we would look at that and say, he's, look at the sin in his life. I, however, only had this one thing. God knew the power of leprosy on a human being's body. And he knew that what was one sore today was going to be the entire body two or three weeks from then. God knew it. So a man's got a problem with alcohol and someone's going to talk him into saying, just one drink won't hurt you. Just one drink. According to God, he's utterly unclean with one drink. Because some people like to play these games with alcohol in the Bible. Well, one drink don't make you drunk. It's one drink. One, one right, white reddish sore on your head doesn't mean that your hand's infected. But according to the law, you are utterly unclean. In fact, look at what happens. Look at what happens. His plague is in his head. Verse 45, And the leper in whom the plague is, his clothes shall be rent, and his head bare, and it should be put covering upon his upper lip, and shall cry, Unclean, unclean. All the days wherein the plague shall be in him, he shall be defiled. He is unclean. He shall dwell alone. Without the camp shall he be his ha the habitation. They're to take this man at spear point if they have to, and they put him outside of the city, and they say, You stay here until either you're healed or you're dead. But you're not coming back in here. You know why? Because you got leprosy and you're going to infect everybody in this town. There's protocols, Centers for Disease Control. If somebody in America ends up with Ebola, God forbid, there are protocols in this country. They will take that person and whisk them away. And as far as I'm concerned, they don't have any constitutional rights after that. Because they have the ability to infect an entire area with a deadly disease that for the most part does not have a cure and sin doesn't and I guess what I'm trying to get at is we justify our one sin and measure ourselves up against everybody else and say we are better than they are because we don't do all the things they do but we only do this one little thing every now and then and God said I don't care you are utterly unclean. I said so. You ought to be run out and put out of town 
Until you repent or until you get things better, until you get this thing destroyed, you're not, gonna, you're not coming back. Is this Bible right? In Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, here's what happens. When the unclean spirit... See, leprosy is uncleanness. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he has come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Then he goeth and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. The last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Oh, bless God, we had revival and I went down. I repented of that one thing that I did. And bless God, I don't have to. I don't do that thing anymore. Don't tell me how good you are. Don't tell me how clean you are. Don't tell, let's not brag, Bethel Church, about how sinless we are. Why, we are 95% more sinless than this church over here across town, bless God. Let's not do that. Let's not even... Well, I know I got my sins, but their sins, that's... One half of the church against the other half of the church. Listen, I've been in church all my life. I have been in this church for most of it. And in this church and at other churches I have been a part of or have pastored, I'm telling you, people get that way in their mind. They find out one thing that somebody's done or two or three or four things somebody's done and then all of a sudden... They're, 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 what's, they're what's the problem right there. When according to the law, if you have a white reddish sore, you're unclean. You are, uh, let me say it, you are utterly unclean. That's why I have no right to stand here and preach this to you. Because for me to say that I am totally clean and live a perfect life, I cannot. And I will not. I won't say it. And I can tell you that my life, my, my own personal way with God is far better than it ever used to be. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm not perfect yet. And until I am, I cannot ever present myself to anybody, including my own church, that I'm better than you. And if I ever do, somebody call me down on it. Amen? You, my sister, amen first. I guess she's going to be first in line. You'll have to get with Sweetie Pie and work it out, okay? And, and like I say, I don't... I don't know who this is for. I don't know what it's for. But this is what God said to say. If you're not totally perfect, you're utterly sinful. Does that make sense? Is that, is that enough? Not quite. i got one more passage of Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 2. I don't know what I did here. 2 Peter chapter 2. Actually, two things, and I'm going to let you go. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollution of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. So you go out, you destroy, what good does it do to destroy Luz if Luz rebuilds itself after you destroy it? And I can't think of the verse. I think I was trying to think of it last night and I forgot about it. But didn't Paul say something about if I rebuild again the things that I destroyed? Does that, rec does that ring a bell with anybody? If I go out and then rebuild again the things that I have destroyed in my life, I'm no better than I ever was. Now turn back to Judges chapter 1. I'm just going to show you this one thing and then I'm going to, we're going to pray and I'm going to let you out of here.
And I have it underlined. This, that was Joseph. Joseph went out after Luz, destroyed Luz, but they left one man go. They made a covenant with him and they showed mercy to him. And they let him go thinking, well, if he's smart, he'll go out and try to hide the rest of his life. Oh no, that's not what he did. What he did was went out and rebuilt the city of Luz all over again. So in Judges chapter 1 verse 27, Neither did Manasseh drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shean. Look at verse 29. Neither did Ephraim drive out the Canaanites. Look at verse 30. Neither did Zebulun drive out the inhabitants of Kitron. Look at verse 31. Neither did Asher drive out the inhabitants of Akko. Verse 32. But the Asherites dwelt among the Canaanites, inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Verse 33. Neither did Naphtali drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemosh. Verse 34. And the Amorites forced the children of Dan into the mountain, for they would not suffer them to come down into the valley. Here's what I'm saying. Let's say that Jody is Joseph. Jody gave her life to the Lord and had it in her heart. She said, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to destroy everything that used to be my past and I'm not going back to it. But let's say that she left things in her life and all of a sudden there they are again. Now they have to be destroyed all over again. But according to this, it wasn't just Jody. Let's say that uh, Brother Sterling is Ephraim. And let's say that uh, Sister Rose back here is Zebulun. So I got two on this side, one on this side. So I'm going to pick on somebody over here now. Let's say that uh, Brother Chris back here is Asher. Uh, let's say that uh, Brother Ron over here is Naphtali. And Scotty, you're Dan. So just as many people on this side of the church didn't drive out the inhabitants as the people on this side of the church didn't do it either. So if I was to have a, an invitation whereupon I invited only those who have not driven out all of their past sins out of their life, how many would come down? It should be the whole of us. Amen? Luz, Philip, Luz is still there. It was built back and it remains just as much of a threat in your life as it ever did. Jaden, sit down. Thank you. I saw that. Lynn. It remains just as much a threat in your life as it ever was. And it has to be destroyed. I'm not picking on you. You're not the one I'm preaching about. Well, maybe I am. Who knows? Before I go off this week, I want us to know that all of us are unclean and undone and not right. And we all need to be clean. Amen? I love you. Thank you. Don't throw any more cards right now. Okay? I just, I want us to, I want you to do something. Okay, I want you to, uh, if you feel like it, I need prayer. Okay, I do. I need a lot of it. And uh, I'm having a tough time right now. So I would ask for God's people to come pray for me. Okay.